Guys, welcome to the second episode we've done of Meet the Expert. On, on this occasion, we're talking to Kate Sterling, who I've known for years. In fact, she was a member of One Element in 2008 when we first set up the business. And she used to come along with a, with a couple of friends and really was involved right at the beginning. And then I'm going to guess here, Kate, but about 2014, you then became a trainer for probably three or four years. And then after that, you then became a franchisee for a while. And then you moved further away from us. So you stopped the franchisee work and have set up your own business that has evolved and continues to evolve. But you're now running a company called Club Thrive, and it predominantly works with women. And your your background within this is obviously the coaching, the training, the, the the number of years of coaching that you've had towards that, and more recently your NLP work. So, I think particularly with your acting skills, and I haven't even mentioned that you're you're a very very talented actress, actor, and using NLP acting skills and training, you've developed a business now, this Club Thrive business. It's about building confidence for for women. Welcome, Kate. Could you tell us a bit about yourself? Thanks, Tom. Um, well, that was a lovely introduction. I haven't heard it reflected back like that before. Um, yeah, so I have been a personal trainer for 11 years. And yes, I you were pretty much spot on with the dates. Um, I was a trainer at One Element for probably five or six years in total. Um, and I am also a yoga teacher and that feeds into it a lot. I, I practiced yoga for over a decade as well and a nutrition coach. And so like you were saying, um, all of these aspects are a big part of me and they're all kind of things that I've focused on and then drawn in together now at Club Thrive. Um, and Club Thrive also, yeah, predominantly works at the minute or the, the focus has been with um, women, but actually I'm, I'm kind of starting to look more at evolving it into gender minorities as a jet you know as a thing um I understand that it's a bit complicated now um you know I always have wanted to be inclusive as well as ensuring that there is that focus for the individuals that that need it um but there's a big passion there because of my own personal experiences you know one element came into my life at a time when I was starting out working in tv uh, so when I came as a member and then it was a massive lifeline for me when my marriage ended and so you know when I came on as a trainer there was lots of other things going on in the background and so Club Thrive also is about this um, power of mindset and like you were saying about the NLP and the life coaching all of these things come together to essentially create a high performance mindset so that whatever comes up in your life you're able to navigate it as best as possible whilst looking after your personal and your professional desires as well because I think as people we we aren't just two-dimensional we have many different parts of us so that's the the overview <laughs> and like you yeah. say it's a slightly early early day business so I'm still still really honing in like we were talking about before we started recording fascinating brilliant thank you Kate for that Brilliant introduction to yourself. Um, so what we're going to talk about today is habits and building confidence. And I think it, I think this could be a really exciting concept. I'm pretty sure we'll only be able to cover it on a pithy level. And I'm hoping that in the future we can dig in and dive into this concept and this idea with more depth and uh, in further detail later on. But to start off, we're, we're fundamentally, we're talking about the brain and building habits. So when we talk about the brain, I think it's quite useful to use metaphors. And more recent, in fact, everyone who's ever talked about the brain has tended to use metaphors. And recently, there's there been the chimp paradox concept of the, the midbrain and this sort of amygdala, this, this brain that is driven like a chimp. There's also, I mean, there are a series of ones, Freud used one about the the sort of horse and cart and not being able to control the horse and and then having a a uh, a sort of old man in the back telling you what to do so having the i the id the ego and so on but one metaphor i love is the elephant and the rider and this is a buddhist concept so the elephant in this metaphor is the is the sort of old brain the the mid brain the, the chimp if you like and it is driven, it is incredibly powerful. It has, because it's the old brain, because it's been developed over six million years, it's gone through a series of iterations and a series of developments. And so it's become this incredibly powerful and 
uh, if you like, very determined midbrain. However, the new brain, if you imagine a, a, an old house has been had, had a number of extensions, this is the new brain that surrounds the old brain. It's the thinking brain. It's the brain that um, reasons. It's the brain that considers ideas. It's the brain that has an epiphany and decides to make change. The problem is that it often doesn't have the power to control the midbrain, the, the elephant, if you like. So the rider is the, the decision maker, but the elephant is the one that often ends up making the decision because it's so well adapted and so well created. Now, what I'm interested in particularly here is when we, we look to make habits and whether that's, that's a habit about health and fitness or whether that's a habit about building confidence, as we'll come on to hopefully in a bit, I'm, I'm interested in the way that, that you see uh, how the, if you like, the midbrain is how we can start to control that through NLP, through um, cognitive work, through building habits, and building, building good habits. So just to start on that front, Kate, would you like to add anything at that point? Yeah, I mean, I think this whole concept of... Um of that analogy that you were talking about with NLP we kind of look at it in terms of parts so NLP stands for neuro-linguistic programming and the premise behind it is that every single part of you has a good intention so that you know even when you're struggling like you were talking about those two different identities almost you've got kind of one half that says I want to go and do this and then you've got the other bit that's like oh no hang on I'm not ready to to get going and so with NLP, we look at the concepts that you have as your perception of your world. So the stories that you're telling yourself, um, the experiences that you've had, the voices that you hear, your perception of whether, you know, that desire to do something is big or small, the size of it, the color of it, even the world that it has created for you. And likewise, the world that you create for yourself within that experience. And so it links exactly to what you're saying, where, you know, when it comes to habit change, for example, if you're wanting to start going to training regularly and yet there's something that's also keeping you stuck on the sofa in front of Netflix when you get home from work um, it's kind of to look at the the parts of those scenarios to understand why you're not able to get out to training and so that's exactly what you're talking about Tom it's that kind of why does the rider want to go somewhere and the elephant's like no way or you know vice versa you've got this disconnect and so NLP looks at that disconnect and it identifies the obstacles and it's very I mean with LinkedIn with life coaching it's very goal orientated so you look at rather than focusing on the problem at the reason why you might not be able to make those habit changes you look at what you want to do and how you want to be in the behavior that you want to inhabit and then it's about breaking it down almost backwards to say, well, what resources do you need? What knowledge do you need? What what confidence do you need? And like you were saying, really, you know, confidence builds from all of this. Um, so, yeah, I'm not sure if I hope that answers your question slightly. Yeah. Like you say, it's kind of you can end up going down quite a specific rabbit hole just from one analogy yeah. alone. No, absolutely. I think I think you put that brilliantly. But what what I'm what I'm really interested. Okay, so let's let's make it really simple. So let's assume the elephant is driven over these six million years by two by two big goals, which is to procreate and to feed. Mm -hmm. So take those two to start with, and when we come on to confidence, I think we'll also look at um, drawing back and drawing towards or the lycometer. If you like something or you don't like something, you move away from it. So we'll start with the two things, uh, procreation and feeding. So let's take let's take feeding, for example, or eating. Mm -hmm. If you wanted to change a habit through NLP about mm -hmm. eating habits, how how would you use NLP to, to improve people's uh, habits around eating and, and what they do? So it's a good question and it will completely depend on, on the individual. So if we talk about it in a broad sense, the... And this is where also I'll bring in my own experience with food. So for those of you that don't know me, I had an eating disorder, I had anorexia when I was 16 or 17. So I've been through it. And, you know, when you work in the creative industries, you have all sorts of these other pressures on your physical appearance. So I've had a very unique journey with food in that respect. So I might approach this in a very different way. But as a whole, um, and it's important to kind of say this, it's to kind of take out the morality around food to begin with, to say that there is no good or bad and to not get overwhelmed by the nutrition element. So it's kind of to say, well, how do you want to feel and how do you want to 
be and how so it's about embodying an identity so this disconnect that we have with food often is that we get in a habit of it and it helps to also comfort or it helps to hide emotion or it helps to um you know mask lots of things that we're experiencing or it becomes that thing of obsession and extreme um right or wrong or good or bad and so it's about finding the middle ground for you as the individual to say and get very comfortable with asking yourself questions. So NLP is also about understanding the voices that you're hearing when it comes to food. So for example, say you've got home from work time and you're like, oh, I really, I really want that burger, but well, that's not very good in terms of how your brain might be hearing it. You might have a message that comes in and says, well, I saw an advert earlier that said that was wrong. So therefore I shouldn't have that because I'm also training. So I should have you know, maybe just a salad or, but actually you might then rationalize and say, well, that salad might not be enough energy. And so it's about getting used to all of these voices that come in and understanding where the messaging is coming from. So obviously as humans, we're programmed to eat, like you say, and it's evolved over time. And we naturally, if you look at kind of bringing up children, we give children food for comfort. And so it's natural that as adults, we also have that as a connection, but then there is always this, this next step of, well, what, what are your actual goals? Is it that you want to up-level your performance on the training field? Is that going to be a goal for you? That's going to be very different to someone who might literally just want to improve their nutrition a little bit. So it really depends on the goal and the motivation and getting very clear on that and getting very honest. For example, if weight loss is a goal, I think we're living, and I've talked about this a lot on my podcast, like we're living in a time where it's quite complicated now with weight loss. You've got a lot of people that say, well, we should accept size bodies at any size, which is true. But you've also then got potentially part of a demographic that's saying, but I want to lose weight and I feel a bit bad about saying that because I'm meant to also feel like I want to accept my body here and so what I say to you from an NLP perspective is be very 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 honest about what you want and sometimes it's not even knowing about how to do that with food it's about saying I want to feel like this I want to look like that and I want to be able to do these things and then you can work backwards to say well how do I need to eat in order to sustain that and then you can get into the finer details of nutrition yeah, I, I I couldn't agree more. I think what you're talking about here is what they talk about in um, cognitive behavioral therapy, which yeah. is known as uh, cognitive dissonance. So trying to create a discomfort between your current behavior and what you're what you would like to do. So building that that dissonance into it, but it, that can also create serious anxiety and stress if you're struggling to to change the behavior. Mm. But, so what you're doing is you're creating, if you like, an epiphany. I, I need to make this change and I need to move forward. However, my, my assertion would be that actually the elephant will not change. Or you may change for a week or two, but then you'll revert back to your original behavior. Mm -hmm. And what I would say, and being a sort of simple person, I would suggest that the guy, the people who make profound changes over the long term have a secret. And what they tend to do is create an environment around them that makes the elephant not ask the questions, if you like. So they, they put a fruit bowl in the middle of the table. They put their trainers next to the door. They find a training group, say, that isn't just about fitness, but actually has a social aspect. So it has another reason to go along or... They, um, they they get rid of any perhaps alcohol that's on the top shelf at home. So you don't see that. What, whatever, whatever the things are, they create an environment around themselves after they've done this cognitive dissonance or, as, as you say, trying to build those, those ideas and those um, arguments, if you like, for change. Then they create the environment around themselves so that they can move forward mm. with uh with with this little temptation basically trying to trying to train the elephant and then they talk about i think, I think three months of of changing behavior then becomes a habit and i think that's probably because you then train in inverted commas the elephant into different behavior mm. Have you got anything, any thoughts on that yeah i've always um been really fascinated by that connection between visual um, cues. And so NLP actually uses that. You have your visual, your auditory and your kinesthetic. So your feel, you know, what you see, what you hear and how you feel. And so all of these things together, like you're saying, create that very strong network of support. 
my I'm slightly different in that as someone who's come from a very restrictive background, there's always this balance where if you have a habit of then creating fear around certain things, um, for me, I person well, and it depends on the individual. I agree with what you're saying, but I always think as well, it's really great to be able to also open a cupboard, see the chocolate and not feel any different. So I like to also encourage that. I'm not saying you should like hide chocolate around your house just to, you know, test yourself, but that there is then this neutral reaction to whether it's a bowl of fruit or a bottle of wine so that you have that choice as an individual to find your own unique balance with it. Um, but that's just my personal experience. And there'll be someone else who will say, well, that's ridiculous because then you're allowing these things into the space. And certainly to begin with, it can be that eliminating those, whether we want to call it temptation or whatever it is, the things that cue you into your older behaviors. So, and this is where self-sabotage can come in. You know, there, there are ways that that can be very, very beneficial, especially to kickstart, you know, a new identity, because this is what it all links into as well, is that you are basically you know, shifting an identity from someone who um, didn't perhaps eat fruit as a snack to someone who does. Um, and that does take time. And this is where self-compassion comes in as well. It's a big component of it is to, when you're figuring all of this out, is is to not put blame or judgment on yourself. If you're trying really, really, really hard to make change and, you know, you, you slip up in whatever term in kind of inverted commas, is to not then say, well, it's all a, it's all out the window. What's the point? Um, and this is where that long term gain comes in, uh, so that you can sustain the choices, the healthier choices, the happier choices for you wherever you are. Um, you know, whether there's fruit there or not. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's what um, what's referred to as the cycle of change. So you have, you have uh, an exit. You have a decision or or. Mm -hmm ideas feed in so you the cognitive dissonance you have a decision that you're going to make change you action the change you maintain the change and then sometimes you fall off the wagon now if you fall off the wagon it, it's it's that response to falling off the wagon that is absolutely critical isn't it because if you feel oh this is a disaster i'll never succeed and i'll never i'll never manage to do this then then you'll stay off the wagon but if you actually think actually you know i've I've just done this once and I can I can come back onto it. And I was quite enjoying the way I was feeling at that point. Mm -hmm. And then you're going back to training the elephant in doing it. But uh, yeah, fascinating. Um, shall we move on to confidence now? Would you be yeah, happy? Sure. Yeah. Okay. So so I think coming back to this elephant and the rider concept, we've we've got the elephant. So again, imagine this has been evolved for six million years in fact it has been evolved for six million years and if you were going to design a let's say a fish and you you wouldn't give equal measure to um i suppose food if you like or a predator you would you would it would be much more powerful reaction to seeing a predator than getting food getting a bit of seaweed because there's going to be more seaweed or more fish whatever you're eating in the ocean but if you get it wrong with the predator you're out of the food chain so your reaction to fear your reaction to to worry which is why we're we we tend to as human beings we tend to the or the elephant rather within us tends to focus on this this negative and fear avoidance and and so on in in the way we we perceive the world and this can often plays into into confidence and how we how we start on the on the confidence route so what i would be love to hear because you're an expert in this kate is how how you build confidence what, what is the key to to getting more confident i think that confidence comes from a deep sense of self-belief and um you know we build confidence the more proof that we have about the things that we're trying to do it takes courage you know like you were saying about the um, just human behavior we like to feel safe we like to, our brain likes to feel safe so it doesn't like us to be in p positions and places that we don't feel comfortable in and so as well when we're trying to push ourselves forwards and it feels uncertain then that kind of sense of comfort that's when the elephant really digs the heels in where it really doesn't want to move forwards because it's like hang on this doesn't feel safe and mm -hmm. so confidence comes over time from finding your evidence so looking back with reflection of building that inner voice of 
listening to the voices like I was saying before about that are coming in that you're hearing that you're that they're either your voices that you're telling yourself I can't do it I'm not good enough that person's faster than me they're better than me you know all these voices that can come in before you go to training for example that especially if you're at the start or you've had an injury or you're coming back after illness and you've got that sense of not belonging or not being a part of something that you want to be a part of it's about going back to that place of self-compassion and saying well I'm just going to show up where I am I say this a lot with clients when they kind of really want to start running and they're like but I'm not a runner and it's because they're comparing themselves to Hussein Bolt or you know Paula Radcliffe and it's there are identities linked to these people that we want to become or that these things that we see and it's about saying, well, that is one way of looking at it, but I can create my own identity and I can step into that over time. And by doing that, that is how you build confidence. And it goes back to what you're saying about environment. So having everything there to set yourself up for success so that you can say, I am someone that puts on my trainers every day. I am someone that eats fruit. I am someone that, um, you know, gets up before I go to work and does a workout. And that that re repetition becomes then more comfortable because we get more used to it. And it's the same with training, that kind of mindset of, yeah, I can push a little bit harder. It doesn't matter if it goes wrong. It doesn't matter if I fall flat on my face in the mud, it's okay. Um, and to not put that self-judgment on, because I think as humans, we're very conditioned as well to, we want to be good at what we do. We want to feel accepted. And so when we mess up a bit, or we feel like we're not as good as everyone else, because we've got those voices that are coming in that are self-judgment or they're, you know, they're kind of pointing out all your flaws, then it's hard to maintain that sense of confidence. And the same if you've had, a, you know, a couple of job knocks where you've had a massive life curveball come in and all of a sudden your place in the world is in jeopardy and you're no longer a part of the status quo and it feels very unsettling. And so it's about coming back to those small things that you can control, like your environment. There's actually a whole, I, I draw it up before um, we started. So it's your environment and then you can link in your behaviours. So it's your where, your behaviours are your what, so how you spend your time, what you're doing in between to help build that confidence, your capabilities, your how. So if you feel like you're not confident in something, maybe it is that you want to get some extra training in. Maybe it is you want to get some extra help, extra support. Um, you know, like with the food, maybe it is you want to learn more about nutrition so that you can eat in a way that supports you to help you feel better in your body, to help you change your physicality, your aesthetics. Then your beliefs, your why. So the belief system that you have is incredibly important. If you don't believe in yourself, then you're going to stay stuck where you are. And it's also that links into the identity. I used to have it all the time when I worked at a yoga studio. People would say, well, I'll come and do yoga when I've got more flexible. And of course, we kind of need to flip that the other way around because it's by coming to yoga that you'll get more flexible. But it's a belief. It's I can't do yoga. And, you know, that's linked to identities. It's linked to all the things we see online. So it's about breaking that down, challenging all the beliefs that are coming in that you have that are holding you back so that you can keep moving the elephant forwards. And then your identity, which is what you were saying after the three month block, you know, once your habits have really become embedded, your identity has changed, you're a different person. And that's why this stuff is so cool, because you actually have so much choice. And it's very challenging when you're not happy in yourself and that confidence is knocked and the self-esteem is on, you know, sometimes feels like it's on the floor. And it's because sometimes you're trying to match yourself now to where you were five, 10 years ago or where you, you would love to be. But practically, you know, you don't have all the support, perhaps, that some of your friends might even have. And so it's also looking at what you have right now at your fingertips to be able to control so that you feel empowered to make the change so that you have that choice. And when you start looking at different options and you take away all the things that you've been told you should do or all the things that you think you, you, you must be doing to look or to be a certain way, you have so much more freedom to then build up your own confidence in your own unique way. Ultimately as well, with confidence, there are going to be some failures and it's about kind of making those a slightly smaller size in the grand scheme of life um, and over time with more practice and you know every time you pick yourself back up it's like on the training field every time you pick yourself back up there's that extra sense of yes I can there's that extra sense of belief and then that translates as well into your personal life which is why you know that whole environment that you've created one element is so special because you like you say you're not just going to train you're going to get all these other elements that are supporting you in yourself as a human all these other very important factors that um, help to build confidence um so yeah you can probably tell I'm exceedingly passionate about it as a topic <laughs> yeah no really can I, I really really like that um I think 
you know, I think what well, you see hit on quite a few things there, but just to, to pull that back a fraction. Um, so firstly, I think confidence, whatever, the, whatever it is, I mean, confidence could be around uh, kicking a ball through a, a set of posts. I mean, there's yeah. a, just re read a very good book uh, by Dan Carter, and he was saying he if he's on form, he can kick the ball from anywhere. But if he misses three kicks in a row, he always comes back to right in front of the post so he can get the ball over. Mm -hmm. And so he can build that confidence. And then that confidence seems to just work with him wherever he goes. I, from, from my perspective, th th there is an aspect of faking it till you make it as well. I mean, obviously, as, as you build more and more confidence, you start to almost be able to press play on the button. So whether that's a socially confident individual who can walk into any party and, and just chat to someone, there, there is an element of, of just building that, pushing those barriers back gently to start with. So just maybe visualizing it, going in, imagine going into that party and talking to someone. From, from my perspective, I remember when I first launched One Element, I, I was really nervous about sort of public speaking mm -hmm. and standing in front of a group of people. And there were only 10 members there on the first session, but mm -hmm. I could hear my voice breaking and I wasn't overly, I was certainly not confident at all at that point. And what happened over a period of time, because I had to go and do it and because I had to push myself into this space is, is gradually, and it became a sort of, I describe it as like pressing play on a cassette player and the session almost just comes out without me really thinking about it and then I can the, the confidence of that is fine and now it's about working with the individuals and the groups and trying to build build their confidence within the session so from my perspective as a as a public speaking aspect I mean it's not really public speaking but you know talking to 10 people I needed to build that up um, and, and become more and more confident on that I think I think for everyone it's an always a work in progress from from what I what I understand from confidence, like you're never you're never you think you maybe can feel completely confident, then you get knocked back, and then it's about these building blocks to to get back up, and that maybe if if we're using the analogy of training the group, it's coming back to a small number and then building up again and feeling more and more confident in that section, and then there's obviously I think you where well, you talked about this a moment ago, but but finding those positive cues within what you're doing, so that might be. If, if it's public speaking, it might be the reaction of the audience. But if it's behavioural change or building confidence in fitness, for example, it may be seeing the, the positive cues of, of what this is doing to you, but also, I think, even more powerful, what's happening at the session. So that sense of euphoria, that sense of achievement, that sense of effort that goes in, that you're, you're then pulling those positives back into the system that are reinforcing this behavior and, and what you enjoyed about it so when you go home you think I actually really enjoyed that so amazingly and and that's something that, that you can take forward um yeah any any more thoughts on yeah what you were talking about visualization is a big part of um of my approach and I really I'm a massive fan of it and like you're saying it kind of helps you to um almost live through an experience before you've even had it and I always say to people with that public speaking it comes a lot up with people who are auditioning or going into meeting rooms regularly or you know um networking events is to try and find out as much as you can about the venue before you're even going so it's you know we have so many tools now at our fingertips to um get a picture in our mind of where we're walking into and then you imagine like you say you imagine yourself going into it and it's the same for people walking into new gym environments or whatever you know it's unfamiliar territory and so it's practicing it in your head and deciding how you want to walk into that place and you know especially even on a day if you've had a bad day at work and you want to go to training it's about saying okay well how do I want to be at training tonight am I just going to be a bit quieter today that's okay too what do you need to do it's like going back to what you're saying about pushing the pull what do you need to do to show up as a very 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 best version of yourself in that moment and you know it's walking in with a bit of a game plan even if like you say you haven't got a clue what you're doing 
I like a bit of faking it till you make it. Sometimes we do have to do that to push ourselves out into that, you know, into that world when we don't feel like we're at our very best, which happens. Confidence goes up and down, which is why I saw a great analogy the other day where, you know, your self-esteem, your self-belief and your self-worth, that's the thing that you can maintain through looking after yourself, through your thoughts about yourself, through as many well-being practices as you can, because confidence is going to come and go. It's, you know, you're going to have good training days, you're going to have bad training days, you're going to have good days at work and bad days at work. And it's about not allowing the bad days to to drain the battery of your confidence to a point where you then can't keep going. Um, and that comes from that. Sometimes you do need to put on that face. I mean, I'm sure you've had this, Tom, you know, it's raining, you don't want to be out of session and you show up with your kind of best self. We all have those days at work where we don't really want to be there. And so it's also about saying, right, well, I've been able to do that in that environment. Let me try and replicate that in this environment that I don't feel so confident in. And that then also gives you that sense of, oh, I've done this before, that sense of familiarity to be able to draw on the skills that you need. Um, so yeah, that's a that's a really good. I'm glad you mentioned that. It's a really good good way of going about it. Yeah, it, it, fascinating. It really well put that that Kate. I mean, just I I think I mean I always I'm always coming at this from a sort of fitness perspective. Mm -hmm. That's where I've been been through, and I I think we we have this concept at one element that people people we have a washing machine effect so people join and then we've got about six weeks for them to maintain their membership or not maintain their membership and really this comes down to the two concepts we've been talking about today which is habits and confidence and you know there's so many things that feed into those two things around how people uh, get on with the other members how they enjoy the training sessions whether they how they react to stiff legs, whether they feel this is a good thing or they feel this is actually not great for their for their their day to day life, um, and then and, and so we know that if we can build that confidence in those first six weeks, if we can build that habit in the first six weeks, the members will stay with us for 10, 15 years because they build a friendship group and they build all the other things that come out of that. Um, Okay, if, if you don't mind, just to, to bring this to a, an end, what I'd love to, you to do is, I'm, I'm sorry, I should have probably told you I was going to ask you this, but it's only just come to me. Um, I want you to to just imagine a, a, a person, an individual, perhaps a woman, perhaps a man, who is perhaps struggling with confidence going into a new job or, yeah, let's, let's take that as an example, or, or looking for a promotion. Let's that, that might be better looking for a promotion maybe doesn't feel like they're, they're quite good enough and yet it's delivering incredible results within the business perhaps isn't getting paid as much as their peers how how would you address that how would you try to to build that confidence into that individual to say actually you know you clearly are achieving this but and and you know the facts are there that they are doing well how do you build that self-belief to actually agree with those facts that, that that are clearly there and they're not being able to see. Mm. So this is where the life coaching comes in and, and, and coaching in that respect really believes that you as the individual or whoever we're talking about here has the answers within them. And so it's a using a combination of reflection and helping them to see their value. So realizing their worth and the achievements that they have done, because I think as individuals, we're not very good at celebrating ourselves. We're kind of constantly cracking on for the next milestone. So it's actually taking time to realize and say, wow, look at what you've achieved. So I would essentially it splits it into parts. What we would look at first is what they feel right now. It's very important to confront everything that's going on, all the challenging stuff. It's really important. I'm a big believer in bringing everything to the surface. That helps to identify all the limiting beliefs because that individual probably at the back of their head doesn't believe that they're capable of the promotion. They don't believe they deserve the promotion. Maybe they don't feel like they have the skills. There's a, there's a lack of belief in themselves somewhere. So a big part of it is identifying that and you can you can discover this yourself by asking yourself questions you know what am i scared of what do i not believe in what what am i what am i thinking here and also identifying the voices is it that you've got something in your head that's from 
a parent or a friend 20 years ago that is so embedded in your mind that you've not been able to move past it. So that's kind of the first stage. The second stage is to say, right, well, what do you actually want? Like in your dream world, if we can let go of all the shoulds and the musts and the kind of societal expectations, what do you truly want? What do you want your life to feel like? Who do you want to be? So it's also about looking at the qualities of the individual that, you know, what makes them tick regardless of the job too it, it really focuses on the individual so that by doing that you immediately start to tap into those things that do help you feel confident that do help you bring that president uh, president's presence which is very important when you're going in for those situations because if you walk into a room really apologetic about being there you're not going to be taken seriously so it is about finding that posture and it's about working with posture working with movement working with breath working with grounding techniques working working with really you know looking at different ways of standing even different ways of breathing different ways of uh, deciding how you want to move into the room practicing that so that you when you go even if it's visualization when you go into that meeting you've got everything there you are like bulletproof with what you're going to say regardless of what the other individual is giving back to you and then it's about embedding those like you were saying as habits as lifestyle as a character almost that you embody and sometimes actually it's a really good way to do it is to choose a couple of different characters or um, even celebrities or people that you admire. So whether it's sports people or people that you work with and say, well, what would it be like to try this from this energy or from this character or from this, I don't know, even if, even if it's like a Disney character or whatever, um, what is it like to walk into that room as Pocahontas to say, I'm going to get this job, please, because this is my proof and I this is what I want. And obviously, then there's a balance. Uh, we have to you have to consider that the, the industry that the individual's in, there's always going to be different parameters to consider. But at the end of the day, my work is about helping the individual walk in with as much belief in themselves as possible so that if they don't get what they want it's not as a result of them it's a result of other people not being able to give them what they want because you have to take responsibility as well it's about also being autonomous with your choices and saying well actually if they're not going to give me what I want maybe actually I deserve to go somewhere else maybe they don't deserve me and so it's also not just assuming that you as the yeah. individual on, you know, in the right. Yeah, absolutely. I think that that answer there has raised so many questions. We could go on for another hour. I'll just I'll just <laughs> cap the questions that I, I would have asked if we were going to carry on for another hour. But I, I love the idea of what do you want? Because I think, you know, society says we've got this greasy bowl we've got to climb all the time. And actually that can be a more powerful message than what do you really want? Because it may be that you don't want, mm. you, really, you don't want this um, promotion because it means a completely different world for you and your family and, mm. and, and and the implications that that has. It may be more money, but maybe that isn't what you want. So establishing what you really want is absolutely key. But if you do decide you want to do it, then I love the idea that you then mentioned about subliminal messaging, this, this idea of being standing tall, shoulders back, confident, belief. And it comes back to this faking it till you make it. So walking through the door, believing you're going to be OK, believing you're going to achieve this. And that sends a huge message to your brain and, and the way you behave. But it also sends an enormous message to the panel or the individual you're going in to talk to and gives you a real strong footing. And also creating the character so creating that that image of this individual who can do it and who has achieved it and then trying to replicate that not just physically but also I suppose intellectually or um, verbally and and all those other cues so not just standing tall shoulders back but actually being able to talk clearly and concisely and being very direct and uh, about what you're what you're looking to achieve mm. um Brilliant, Kate. Really enjoyed that chat. If, if Is there anything you want to talk about before we wrap this to a close? No, thank you so much for having me on. And um, I do have a podcast that goes into more detail about all this stuff, very originally uh, called Club Thrive, the podcast. So if you want to check out more about it, then you can definitely go and, and check that out. There's a lot more, a lot more on what we've spoken about today. Fantastic. Well, if we'll get a we'll get a link on. Um, Onto, onto the website so people can or onto the onto the YouTube video so people can dip into that as well for some fascinating insights from you Kate so thank you so much for your time and and thoughts and 
brain that we've uh, experienced and looking forward to chatting to you again soon. Thanks, Tom. Pleasure.